everybody, welcome to our burning question this week. I'm Toya. I'm Robert, and we are waiting for this burning question, little lovey. Chrysler asks, how does one find inspiration to move forward when learning the guitar or keyboard or piano? Or anything at all, I would say. For me, it's um, improvisation. So you always run over the keys on your hands. You memorize them, visualize them, make yourself do that, but then improvise with them. Even if you're improvising to a pretty simple piece of jazz and you know the key, it's so fulfilling and you discover yourself and your own tunality within you because a lot of people are technically brilliant and have absolutely no sense of melody some people have incredible sense of melody and no sense of technique so it teaches you about yourself i'd say impro is just as important as the absolute workings of music good i would agree with that i put it slightly differently that we begin with perspiration we learn our instrument, we, lose the mu we learn the music, and then we play. And as we're playing, we may find that the music comes to life beneath our fingers. And then as we play more and more, we may find that music is always alive. So what we do is we do our part, we do our practice, we do our work, we do our perspiration, and then we find maybe the inspiration, the life within the music, finds a way of coming to us. And I would say to you, don't just do the technicalities of music when you're holding the instrument. If you're sitting on a bus, if you're sitting on a train or even an aeroplane or lying in bed unable to sleep, run through it in your head. Visualize it, run through it, use that time. It will release the pressure off you when you pick the instrument up again. Now, another thing that isn't very helpful when you're improvising or learning is having someone next to you doing this when you're playing and just pointing out that your timing isn't spot on by a nanosecond. Do not beat yourself up. Playing is to express yourself, to experience yourself, not to beat yourself up. Would you agree with that, Mr. Frick? I agree with just about anything my wife says. Now, Chrysler's <laughs> question is, how do you move forward and find inspiration? For me, if I put on one of my favourite songs and I jam along to it, and it's so easy to do these days, if you're jamming along to a David Bowie song, you can get the chords up on the internet and you just jam along to it. And it just explains and expresses to you how someone wrote the song in the first place. For me, that is inspiring. There are five primary elements of practising. The calisthenics, left and right hand coordination, this is obviously primarily the guitar, but it applies to keyboards as well. So calisthenics, fingerboard knowledge. Yeah. Repertoire. Fretboard knowledge. Yeah. Repertoire, the particular musical pieces you're engaging with. The ear. And for an experienced professional musician, as my wife began saying, it's very easy to forget to play, to have fun without judgment. You've got the instrument, you've got music calling to you, calling to all of us. Let's have fun, let's suspend judgment and rock out. I find it so interesting because some people have music playing in their head without playing anything. Uh, I'm one of those. I'm, ideas are just churning the whole time and I have to learn to get them out through my body in a technical way that other people understand. My co-writer Simon Darlow, music churning through his head and he's first to admit that he has no music theory, it's all natural to him and yet we've come across people who are absolutely splendid at the keys, the related notes, the rela related harmonics, and they don't have one ounce of musicality in their body. Neither are wrong. Find what's right for you. Do not try and be a musician by being someone else. I've been married to this man for 35 years, and I've seen 99.99% .99 people trying to be Robert Fripp. Don't. Be guided 
by Robert Fripp's experience and what he can give you and then be you. Excellent, loving. Is that okay? That's superb. If I come across another person trying to be you when they haven't done the groundwork that you've done, I, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do because it's such a waste of time. It's like knocking a bridge down from one piece of land to another, blow the bridge up and then try and leap the gap. Robert has put in five to eight hours a day of technique and theory for all of his working career. So you cannot leapfrog that in any way. Good. Good. Okay. Um, last question, Paul. It's October. Ah. Why the Christmas decorations? In this house, Christmas begins on October the 1st. Now, let's look at this. First of all, before I met T, the Fripp family Christmas was always the day of the year. Uh, my sister only ever missed one Christmas, which was in 1967 when she moved to San Francisco. I only missed one Fripp family Christmas, in 1977 when I moved to New York and I spent most of it with Eno. Now, since we've been together, uh, we've had all our Christmases together, but usually I'm away touring and this is, playing music to people is always a privilege, but there is a very high personal price to be paid. Now, for example, if you tour Japan, Conventionally, in Japan, touring nowadays goes right up to Christmas. And I've arrived home, flown and landed on December the 23rd, waking up on Christmas Eve here, addled and useless. Fortunately, this Crimson Tour, I'm coming home uh, in the middle of December. So why the Christmas decorations in October? Because you put them up, dear. Okay, my husband, as he says, misses quite a lot of the Christmas experience because of touring. So I decided to put the Christmas decorations up in October so that he could experience Christmas before he goes away. It's an incredibly evocative and powerful experience for my husband. And while he's away, I want him to know what he's coming back to. In Bill's last year, Bill was with us in October. So I put the decorations up, not only for Robert, but also for Bill Reeflin, so that we could have three weeks together celebrating with Bill as well, having a pre-Christmas, which I'm so glad we did because that was the last Christmas we had with him. Um, it's just phenomenally important to us to have light, colour and stimulation in our life. You've probably seen a lot of the house by now and none of it is quiet visually. It's all about visual stimulation. So Christmas for us coming early is about hope and knowing that at some point things are going to slow down and we can just be together. Now you've reminded me of one thing in your answer. For about 30 years of our marriage you were never with me on New Year's Eve and it was wretched. You would go away on New Year's Eve and I'd be the single woman at a New Year's Eve party without a dancing partner. And I had to say to you at some point, this is not how to spend New Year's Eve. And you, you gladly kind of accepted it. Gladly accepted it. Yes. I don't think he's done it since. But boy, that was hard. But anyway, those are memories in the past. We look to the future and we feel very positive about the future. And as for touring, we're addressing that we want to do more social media and live work through technology and spend more time together. These are precious years. So we're looking into how we can be visual artists through technology without my husband having the incredibly backbreaking touring schedule. And in some way for me as well, even though I think I will always disappear and make movies. All right, then. Good. Thank you for those questions. Burning questions of the week. Yay. Stay safe, everybody. See you tomorrow for an absolutely crazy Sunday lunch. Lots of love. And from Robert.